what I'm going to talk about is less so about cells, since my PhD yeah. is in developmental cognitive neuroscience. So it's more cognition, less about cells. So that's going to be a bit of a change for today, I guess. And specifically, I'm looking at the development of numerical cognition or how we interpret or how we learn numbers more specifically. Obviously, I'm going to talk about animals first, since we all like animals. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about first as an example is the honeybee. Because uh, these little bees, they, they're very good at differentiating quantities. So they know if you show them two things, they know which of the two groups is more and which of the two is less. And that's actually something we can find in a lot of different animals. They found it in not just bees and ants, but they found it in uh, dogs and in wolves and all kinds of animals and in elephants too. And of course, humans, if you, uh, if you get a newborn baby, just right after it pops out and you show them stuff, they, they are able to differentiate between quantities. Not sure what uh, the newborn baby needs to do with that information, but they can. Um, the honeybee can also know exact values. So when you show, show them two groups, they can sort of estimate. So you're not really sure how many there is, but it's just, a, you know, which one's more and which one's less. Um, if you have the honeybee, they can also know exact values, just like certain animals, not all of them. And with exact values, I mean that if you show them three things, they know exactly that it is three things. Um, humans can do the same. That's pretty cool. And also lions can do the same and dolphins and a lot of other animals. Um, and honeybees also have a concept of zero and they can even do math so they can add and subtract stuff. So yeah, bees are, bees are pretty cool. And humans are kind of special still because despite the fact that a lot of animals can estimate and a lot of animals have exact representations, uh, which is still really useful. Um, humans are a little bit special because most of these exact representations, which is something that's pretty advanced, they're limited to just around four things. So you, you probably have experienced that before. If you see anything like two or three things, you kind of see how many they are. You can see if it's two things or three things and you don't even have to count. But once they get to four or more, then you have to count. And this range of up until four, uh, we call that the, the subitizing range. And that's going to be important later on. And um, what's so special about humans is that we've managed to extend our exact representation. So this um, point where we know exactly how much things is, we expanded that and we expanded that using uh, symbols. So we all see this and we know exactly how much this means. You don't really think about it anymore, you know exactly what it means, because this is a symbol and it means four. If you see that, you mean it's four things. Um, the thing is that we had to learn these and it happened a long time ago and we don't really remember that, but there was a time where we had no idea what this symbol meant. And it's kind of weird because the symbol, it doesn't have anything to do with four things. It represents four, but it has no like foreignness, innate foreignness to it. And the best way to show that, if I show you these, like all of these mean the same thing, but you will probably only recognize a couple of these, but they all mean the same thing. These are all abstract symbolic representations of the same thing. And at some point, somewhere around the world, someone learned one of these symbols and they can see them and they know right away, this means four. And that's very special. And it's very powerful. It's what's allowed us to build some really cool civilizations and cool machines. And we use it in our day to day lives and it allows us to do all our science. So numbers are convenient, but we had to learn them at some point. And this is where the concept of mapping comes into play, because this is what we subject our poor kids to. We have, like these non-symbolic representations like we have over here, where whatever item we show, it's one-to-one -one with the number they represent. We have four dots, we have three lemons, uh, we have uh, two kitties, 
and there's two of them and you can count them if you want but like small babies they, they can't count yet but they can see it that's where the subatizing range comes into play you can see how many they are without counting at the bottom we have symbolic representations so just by seeing this symbol you have no idea what it represents you have to learn this so somehow we have to take this quantity that we see and connect it to a symbol and that is mapping and that is what kids have to learn when they're really young and busy with all kinds of other stuff and that's what i'm studying so they um they investigate this how that works with kids and it's actually really funny how that works because um any parent among us or who's listening to this they will might recognize this that kids are pretty quick when they start talking that they also start counting like they know the words they can count up to 10 maybe even higher and kids really like to count and at some point they start counting and you can't shut them up anymore they go to 20 um, or sometimes they go to 15 and then they start stumbling they go to like 12 13 and then 17 24 they, they stumble which is weird because after 12 ish all our numbers are pretty logical they just one follows the other there's no strangeness going on what happens here is that the kids know the words but they don't know what the words mean and that's uh, if you ever get the chance and you find that your child is in that phase where it's counting a lot you can do a little experiment and just ask them for something just ask them for three stuffed animals or four stuffed animals you know that they can count up until 10 but if you ask them for three stuffed animals and they don't know what three means they'll just get you a random number or they just get you number they get you stuffed animals until you tell them to stop what we see is that kids start to learn how much each word means one one at a time one by one so at first they have no idea how much it is and they just give you a random number and at some point they realize how much one is so if you ask them for one stuffed animal they will get you exactly one stuffed animal every time they get it if you then ask them to get two stuffed animals they're lost again they'll just, just get you something random it's not even close to two they just make something up and then after a few weeks they'll learn two and then three um until about four ish and that's where something weird happens once they reach four something clicks we call that the cardinal principle so they realize that the words they know represent a certain quantity and then suddenly they know all the words they know exactly how much everything is and they'll learn how to count and then it goes really fast but it's those first four three to four that's really hard and it takes a while and that's where my research also takes place and it's the same range as all the other animals that we saw the the bees from the bees until the dogs until the wolves and the lions they can all go up until about three or four and then things get fuzzy and that's that's an evolutionary thing since since it either happened really early in evolution or it happened at the same time for a lot of species and a lot of people had some ideas about this so the first one was the ans mapping account it basically said well in your brain you have neurons that respond to a certain quantity like you have specific neurons that will fire maximally when you see one thing and when you see two things or three things and we simply associate the symbol with the quantity and then it just goes on until however many you learn but it didn't really work out and there were a lot of uh, caveats with that one so we got a new one the the alternate account doesn't really have a name quite yet which said that um we take these and we see exactly how many they are so we know that this is one and this is the first and this is the second and so forth and we connect these two so that's what the, the kids also do so they start to connect the word to the quantity that they can see that they don't have to count because they can't count yet um, and then after they get to the third or fourth then they start learning it through inferential learning so they realize okay it's first one and after one comes two and then 
after three and then they realize, oh, I have this whole word list in my head. And with this whole word list, that all means something. Those all mean quantities. And then they learn really fast. And then they don't need those quantities anymore. They can just learn by what they know. And they can just be smart about everything. Um, so that's where my first project was, or the first half of my PhD, basically. Where we're going to be looking at how that works in the brain, or if we can even find how that works in the brain. So what we want is, um, we saw that those first four symbols are apparently learned differently. That's what all the uh, previous research showed. And that's not really in line with, with the old models, but it would fit in the new models. So if those first four symbols are in, indeed different, then we should be able to see those in a learning paradigm. We should be able to teach people new symbols and see what happens. So we see that, um, just a little repeat, we know that when we look at non-symbolic quantities, we can see that anything higher than four, they don't have some kind of exact number in mind. So they see anything higher than four is just a lot. And they just guess. And then if you have to guess a number, if you don't really know how much it is, then you can't really connect it to anything. Because then the, sim the symbol will not be learned. So it could only happen in the ones where you actually know how much the symbol means. And all the other ones use a different system, this inferential learning. So what we wanted to see is if we can capture the mapping process. Can we measure uh, the brain actively associating this information, this numerical information, with these new symbols? And that's what we let them do. So we, we gave them this, this fun little task. Um, they, all they had to do was tell us if the quantity they saw, so the dots that they saw, were the same as the quantity of the symbol. So you see, uh, they, we show them a couple of dots, then we show them a symbol, then they have to tell yes or no, and then they get some feedback if their answer was correct or incorrect. They don't get any further training, that's all they get. And then based on the feedback, they will somehow have to figure out what all these symbols mean. And we did that for three sessions over two days um, with adults, well, you know, university students, adults, close enough. Um, so that's what we did. And what we expect is that when they see three dots, they know that it's three. And when they see all of these, they know that it's a lot. Because half a second that we show the dots, it's not enough to start counting them or uh, do the quick math that adults can do. So then they're kind of lost. So we expect them to be able to learn the symbols when they can actually see how many it is. And when they can't see how many it is, then we don't really expect them to do much with the symbol. So they just get like this generic thing. Okay, it's, it's a big one, it's a big symbol, but I don't know exactly how much it is. It could be six, could be seven, who knows? And that's more or less what we saw. So this is just a behavior. And we'll just look at this real quick. This is the accuracy that we see. And we see that in the first four that we talked about, we see that they actually start learning. So the first one, they learn pretty quickly already in the first session. And by the second session, they show that they pretty much, yeah, they're, they're getting pretty good at it. Well, in the higher range, we have more or less flat lines. They do learn a bit, but it's more like a generic thing that they learn that it's a high symbol and that like the odds kind of are in their favor then. If you know that it's at least high, then you have a higher shot of getting the right answer. But with this task, there's a lot of variables involved. So you have quantities that are low and high. In some cases, they have to say that it's the same number. In some cases, they have to say it's a different number. There's a lot going on there. Um, and we actually want to know exactly what's going on. And behavior doesn't help us with that a whole lot. We can tell that, they, that something is happening in the lower range, that they're learning in the lower range, but I know, how are they learning it? What information are they using? Not quite clear yet. Because accuracy and reaction time as well, it's, of course, it's an end state measure. So that's the result of a lot of things going on in the brain. And we actually want to know what's going on in the brain, not just what it produces in the end. 
Um, so this is where we have these neural correlates, which can help us exactly what's leading to the behavior we see. And my neural correlate of preference is EEG, more specifically the ERPs. Um, the concept is not that difficult, it's really easy actually. We just show them a whole lot of these numbers and every time the brain reacts to it, we record the, the neural activity. Uh, but there's a lot of noise in there and there's also a signal in there. If you just do it often enough, then all the random noise will average out and everything that's left will be a nice little curve like this. Because this is everything that's very consistent on what we show them and everything that's not connected to what we show them, all the random noise will just average out. The ones uh, that we're interested in is this one and this one. So all these peaks that we see, they all have a certain meaning and a lot of smart people did a lot of manipulations to toss to figure out what all these things mean. So that's very helpful for us now. And it all depends on exactly also what task you're doing. So in the case of what we're doing to the participants, we know that uh, this little dip here, so the first negativity, um, that's usually, um, usually coincides with surprise. In the case of if something is very repetitive, then this will get uh, lower and lower. So it gets less negative in this case. And if it's suddenly something that surprises you, it will get more negative. So the peak will go down. The second one we look at is this one here. Um, and that is one that is more associated specifically with numbers. It's the one that a lot of number people also look at. Um, and it's not really clear exactly what it's associated with. Some say that it's associated with more effort. So you need more attention. Um, some, uh, but in the end, it's, it has to do with access to the numerical meaning. So if this thing happens, the more positive it is, the easier it is to get access to the numerical me meaning of what we're looking at. Um, and we're also looking at these parts right in the back of the brain. That's where they found where numerical processing seems to happen. Um, and we're only also looking at the trials where the numbers and the dots were not the same. We're looking at the different ones because those are the only ones where we can see what is caused by the dots and what is caused by the symbol. Um, and this is how it looks like. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, what we found, so I'm not going to go through all the analysis because that's, that's a lot of work and it's really boring. What we found is that this first part here, we see that this increases over time. So as they learn the symbols from the first session to the third session, we see that this one gets more negative. But only if the dots that preceded the symbol were in the small range. So it's only for the green line and for the blue line where it goes down. This one, on the other hand, the one that's associated with the meaning of the symbol, we see that this um, also decreases over time. So there's less effort involved, but only for the green line and the orange line, the ones that are associated with symbols in the small range. So they need less effort to actually access the numerical meaning. So what this means, uh, so this is probably easier to understand. It means that the first component, so very early on, you see the new symbol. And as soon as you see the new symbol, there's what's called a violation of expectation. So at first you see the dots and let's say you see three dots. So you know, okay, this is three. And then you start making uh, a prediction of what you're going to see because you need to answer. You need to tell me if it's the same or different. So you're going to expect to see the symbol that belongs to three, but then you see a different symbol in this case, a two, and that's a violation of your expectation. So that's a surprise. The same happens if you see three dots and you see a symbol that you don't know. It's not the one you predicted because you don't know which one it is. So there's also a surprise. So this first component tells us that people actually process the quantity and they make a prediction of what they're going to see. So they've learned the symbol because they know what's going to come next. The second component is more on this side. We see that uh, no matter what they expect, 
So either they see three dots and they know there's gonna be three or they see a lot but they have no idea what's gonna come next. If they see a symbol they know, then this component responds. And if they see something they don't know, the component doesn't respond. So we know they learned these symbols in the lower range because this component is responding to it, but they didn't learn the symbols in the higher range. They just knew that it was a high symbol, but they had no idea what the actual meaning was of the symbol. And this is a fun picture I always use. It's very complicated, it looks confusing, but I love it. So what happens in, uh, in our experiment that we did, before people start learning, they can, they can already do this part. So you see a number of dots, and up until four, you know exactly how many there are. And all of the higher ones, you don't know how much they are. So that's just a lot of dots. It's not fast enough to count them. So that is what we know. Then if you have to tell me if, which symbol it is, if the symbol corresponds to it, yeah, it, it could be any of the nine symbols. You don't know. So you see three dots, you know, okay, it's three. Which symbol is it? No idea, it could be either. Same with if you see a lot of dots, which symbol is it? Not a clue, could be either. Then after we learn, we see that they've actually connected. They, they literally connected the dots here. So we see three dots and we know which symbol belongs to it. So they made this connection, but in this range, they didn't make the connection. And we know that because like I said, this first component says that they see three dots, they know it's three, so they predict this symbol. And when they don't see this symbol, then that response happens. And the same happens for the symbols. We show them the symbol for three, so they know exactly which quantity belongs to it. And that doesn't happen in this range. So no matter how long we give them in this task, they will never learn these high symbols because they will never have the information needed to make this connection. So to learn these symbols, they would need more than just the quantity. They will need some kind of word list, like the kids have. They need to know how these symbols relate to each other, not just how it relates to the quantity. And that's how you can turn this and this, then you know how it all works. Um, so the conclusion of our experiment here was that we know that in behavior, only the smaller numbers show learning effects. And in the high range, it's just this, this general learning effect. And the brain tells us that these quantities can only be represented exactly uh, in the low range. And that's where we use numerical information. We know this from this first component. And we know that numerical access is only possible for symbols that have been learned, which was also only the small numbers. And then a little preview, like in the second part of my PhD, I'm actually looking at uh, stimuli that can be both symbolic and non-symbolic. And if that's confusing, it's actually really logical. It's, it's your hands. Your hands can be both symbolic and non-symbolic. And I always love talking about hands, especially if it's a international crowd because everyone starts looking at their hands when they talk about this. So representing your quantities with your hands is something that happens all over the world. It's, it's an automatic thing but it's also a cultural thing. So holding up your fingers in a specific way to show others how much you mean, it still happens in adults too, if there's like a lot of loud noises and you want to tell someone how many beers you want or whatever, you hold up your fingers. But the way you hold up your fingers, which fingers you hold up to tell someone you want three or two, that depends on how you were raised. And this specific configuration, so how you hold your fingers up, that's a canonical representation. And we, we think that that one becomes symbolic, just like the, the numbers. You don't have to count your fingers anymore. You see the hand and you know exactly how much it is. On the other hand, you have the non-canonical ones and they will require either counting or estimation. And that will likely be some kind of non-symbolic representation. And since it's the same uh, stimulus, you can do some fun experiments with that. Um, what we want to know there is if the canonicals help or if the non-canonicals hinder. And we want to know how useful our hands are. 
because we know you don't necessarily need them to learn symbols, but they do help a lot. And we want to know how they influence the numerical processing in adults, but also in children. And to add to what I talked about and what my, most of my PhD is also about, I want to see if it's limited to the small range, because you can count up to four or five, but you only need one hand. And if you need the second hand, well, do you still use your hands for that? Or is there something else involved? Um, but, but that's for another time. And that's the end. That's